Today is Thursday, November the 19th of 2009, and I want to just speak very quickly here. I'm doing a special message here on a uh, just very wicked false prophet, which is getting himself into the news here. And, you know, there are so many false prophets out there, I can't refute each one of them. But when I see Christians starting to fall for that false prophet, um, I start getting a little bit upset. And uh, we're going to get into this a little bit here. I want to play a clip from this man. His name is Pastor, and he's a false prophet, but uh, Pastor James David Manning. So let's play a little clip from him. I am James David Manning, pastor of the Atla World Missionary Church in Harlem, Atla, New York. I am also the host of the daily radio broadcast called The Manning Report. On the 16th of November, 2009, on or about 6 p.m. in the afternoon, two CIA agents claiming to be members of Homeland Security, and two New York City detectives came to our church to ask me questions regarding statements I have made about Barack Hussein, the long-legged Mac Daddy, Obama. They drew my attention, the agents did, to a posting on our website called Tea Party Members Go Viral on the Birth Certificate. And in that particular posting, I stated that the long-legged Mac Daddy is invincible by the vote. But only should you turn your attention to the birth certificate issue, then he becomes outrageously vulnerable. He is indeed an illegal alien and is not qualified to be the U.S. president. But to spend all of my energy and time to overthrow this evil that has entered into our world. As an American patriot, I'm compelled to fight to restore our republic and its constitution. I expect as a result of the visit last night by the CIA and New York City police detectives, Homeland Security people, I expect to be arrested in not too many days. Therefore, I pray to explain the entire matter of the dark kingdom and my representation of light in these very dark and evil days. I will be charged with the threat against the life of the U.S. president. Understanding that I will be arrested, I wish to state to my church family, friends, and supporters that at present I am of a sound mind, that the evil dark kingdom that is now led by Barack Hussein, the long-legged Mac Daddy Obama, that they in the arrest will not take my freedom simply by placing me in chains. But they took the freedom from all of us with their acts of treason and their conspiracy to commit treason against the American people. Thusly, we all have lost our freedoms. I want you to know, my church family, friends and supporters, that I knowingly and willingly have submitted to my God who asked me to serve him in this cause and in this matter. And he alone has set my course, and he alone will be my judge. And so I say to Mr. Barack Hussein, the long-legged Mac Daddy Obama, members of the Central Intelligence Agency, Eric Holder, Leon Panetta, and all the others, that here I am at the Atla World Missionary Church in Harlem, Atla, New York. You may come and arrest me. I am waiting. I will not resist, for I welcome that you would do so. And in doing so, we can finally bring this matter of your ineligibility to serve this great republic. And your belligerent trashing of the Constitution can be brought to the American people. 
I await your arrest. I'm James David Manning, and I ask that God would bless all of us and that he would save America. Okay, now that sounded really good, didn't it? Uh, but the truth is, when you actually look into this James David Manning guy, you will find very quickly that he is, uh, to say he's a false prophet would be a great understatement. Okay, now let me start out by reading Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31. Paul speaking here, he says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, I don't think he invoked the name of Jesus at all. And, uh, of course, you can't see it, but on the video he's standing behind a pulpit with a big shield and everything on front. Looks like a shield of a crusader, uh, which... We're going to see the guy has some very serious Catholic leanings. But underneath the uh, where he keeps his Bible out there on the pulpit, underneath at the top of the pulpit, it says, Jesus is Lord. And the guy will oftentimes invoke the name of Jesus. And, of course, a lot of Christians are very deceived by that. They think, oh, then he's a Christian because he talks about Jesus. Nothing could be further from the truth. I just want to read here. This is from his website, this Manning guy's website. Atla.org. That's www.atlah.org. And we're going to look at what this Atla thing means. And um, if you get on there and you click on the About Us and then About Pastor James David Manning, um, you'll see there's a picture of him in a red robe, just like the Pope wears. You know, the robe that has the little cape that comes up down about to the middle of your chest. Just It looks like he's a pope, and it's a red robe, and he's holding up a communion wafer, just like a Catholic priest would. And it says here, the very first paragraph says, James David Manning, from born February 20th, 1947, is chief pastor, chief pastor, hmm, at the Atla World Missionary Church on 123rd Street in New York City. Manning grew up in Red Springs, North Calif Carolina, and has been at Atla since 1981. Atla stands for All the Land Anointed Holy, which is God's name for Harlem. So, God's kingdom on this earth is located, it's centered in Harlem. Hmm. We're going to get into that in a little bit more, too, as time progresses here. And then the second paragraph says, Manning graduated from the College of New Rochelle with a Bachelor of Arts degree and continued on to, guess where, Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, where he was awarded a Master of Divinity. Now, I have here a book by Dr. Kathy Burns called Billy Graham and His Friends, and on page, let me flip to it here, uh, let's see, page 137, well actually 136, she begins to speak about Union Theological Seminary, this place, but on page 137, she's talking about a guy, Van Dusen, is his name, Henry Pitney Van Dusen. And she says here, to comprehend the situation better, we need to take a look at uh, Un Union Theological Semini Seminary, where Van Dusen taught, and which he later headed. We are told that this seminary is the leading and most influential liberal seminary in the U.S., U.S. News mentioned that the UTS was one of the most liberal and left-wing schools in America. John D. Rockefeller Jr. helped choose the site for this building. In 1922, he launched an endowment drive and gave a gift of $1,083,333, which was about 25% of the goal. In fact, over the years, Rockefeller Jr. had donated more than $50 million to Riverside Church Union Theological Seminary and International House alone. And, of course, you can do some study into the Rockefeller family and uh, find out they have their hands in some very wicked, very corrupt things. They're a very evil family. Uh, but the next two pages later, page 139, we read, Union Theological Seminary is a school that is supposed to train clergy, yet a Union Theological student was able to join the on-campus, on-campus, atheists, club, if he so choose. 
How many church pulpits were filled by students who belonged to this club? Hmm. Why would a theological seminary have an atheist club? Here's another thing on page 140 of Kathy Burns' book. Henry Sloan Coffin, a Skull and Bones member, initiated in 1897. That's up at Yale University. You can do some research on that. It is very highly satanic. They have to lay naked in a coffin and go through a satanic ritual where they basically pledge allegiance to Satan. I mean, very, very, very wicked, very evil. And again, you can study that. There's not enough time to cover that here, but this Henry Sloan Coffin, interesting last name too, uh, he was a member of Skull and Bones, and it says here that he was a professor of practical theology at Union from 1904 to 1926, and president of Union Theological Seminary from 1926 to 1945. Coffin was the former moderator of the Presbyterian Church in the USA. The devil likes to get his men into religious circles. A couple paragraphs down here it says, He wrote in a book called The Meaning of the Cross, quote, Certain hymns still perpetuate the theory that God pardons sinners because Christ purchased that pardon by his, obe by his obedience and suffering. There is no cleansing blood which can wipe out the record of what has been. The cross of Christ is not a means of procuring forgiveness. End quote. Now that guy was the head, the president of Union Theological Seminary. And that was back in 19... 26 to 1945. Can you imagine how liberal and wicked it is now? And this is where this James Manning was educated. But it goes on here, on uh, atla.org, it says, Manning also holds a Doctor of Philosophy, PhD, degree from the Atla Theological Seminary, an unaccredited educational institution. <laughs> uh, in other words, they have a theological seminary there at their church, and uh, he was given a Ph.D. from his own seminary. Uh, it works out pretty good. Okay. Now, let's go down to uh, a couple paragraphs down. It says here that uh, he attended Oxford Round Table at St. Anthony's College in the University of Oxford, the 16th of August, 2004. Isn't that interesting? Because... Many, many prominent occultists like J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, I forget which one it was, whether it was Westcott or Hort, the men who brought out the New Bible versions based on the Roman Catholic, the Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus. There has been Oxford University for many, many years now has been a center for liberals and, in fact, occult philosophers. And this guy's going to a roundtable discussion at St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford. That's pretty interesting, too. Now, on to the next paragraph. Manning is fiercely opposed to the gentrification of Harlem and calls for its residents to boycott its shops, restaurants, doctors, banks, and churches. That action, combined with a general rent strike, would force all property owners out of Harlem, he said, leaving the neighborhood to its rightful inheritors, black people. I'm reading this thing word for word. You can get on there and check it out. It actually says this. Manning calls his plan, No dew nor rain, after Elijah's warning to Ahab, king of Israel, of a coming drought. When there's no dew nor rain, there's a drought. There's all kinds of suffering, said Manning. The whole of Harlem, he said, is to be a drought zone. Now, it's kind of interesting, because why is he trying to do this? What is the, the purpose of, of bankrupting all the white people in that city or in, a, in the area of Harlem there and basically getting it back to the black people. Why would he do that? Well, on another page, if you get on atla.org, there's a section called Father Ham. And here we read, let me read here, it says, Ham is the son of Noah. As the sons of Noah boarded the ark, Almighty God commissioned Shem to be the keeper of the flocks and beasts. Ham was assigned the task to preserve the knowledge of creation and pre-creation. He also carried the science of mathematics and medicine with him into the ark. Japheth, Japheth wasn't given anything to carry aboard the ark. Really? Well, Ham is the father of the Africans. Japheth is the father of the Europeans. Shem is the father of the Oriental, the Jew, the Indian, 
and of course the Asiatics. But uh, is there scripture to back this up? Well, Genesis chapter 7, verse 13 through 17. Let's, I'll read this very quickly. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they went in, and they that went in went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the Lord was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. Now where did it say that Shem took care of the animals, and that Ham took in science and medicine and everything else, and Japheth didn't do anything? It doesn't say that. Manning is a liar. Okay? Genesis chapter 8, verse 15 and 16. Let's read that. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives, with thee. So here the flood is over, and God's saying, Okay, you can leave now. Uh, Genesis 8, verse 18. And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives, with him. It does not say anywhere that Ham was somehow the superior intellectual one. That is a lie. It's a false teaching. Genesis 9, 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons... And said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Okay, so you see, God blessed all three sons. And we're going to look at some other scriptures here. Okay, now let's look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, and Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Now why was that written there? Well, you're going to see. Uh, verse 19, These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Now Noah was not a drunk. Okay, I believe that what happened here is after the flood, before the flood I think that the atmospheric conditions were different, and I don't think that, that uh, grape juice, or new wine as it's called in the Bible, I don't think that it would ferment in the first earth before the flood. Uh, things were different back then. People were living to be 900 years old. Something definitely was different. The atmosphere was different. Uh, and you can study about that. That's a very interesting study. Uh, Dr. Kent Hovind's videos explain that in greater detail about the conditions of the first earth. So here he is after the flood, and he grows some grapes, and he goes to take the new wine and probably had it sitting around for a while. And I really don't think that Noah understood, you know, the fact that it now is going to ferment and it's going to make you drunk. I don't think he knew that. Noah was, was a preacher of righteousness. Now let's look at verse 21. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Now who is Canaan? Well, back up to verse 18. Ham is the father of Canaan. So Canaan is the son of Ham, his descendants. Genesis 9.25 again, And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Uh, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Verse 27, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Okay, Genesis chapter 10. You can read that whole chapter sometime. We're not going to cover it all. But it describes the three sons and who they became the ancestors of. They, they each went different directions, and then they had offspring. And I believe the three sons probably looked the same. 
but through inbreeding within their own families, which is what they did back then. There's no other choice. Nobody else was left on the earth. Through the inbreeding, they developed characteristics and traits. Okay, um, Genesis 10 talks about Shem. He went east, and he became the ancestor of the Oriental, the Indian, and the Jew. Okay, and of course you can read about that. Uh, Luke chapter three verse thirty six, in fact, talks about Shem, and it's spelled S E M because you have it's in Greek there, Greek to English, uh, whereas the Old Testament is Hebrew, in you know being translated into English. But Shem in Luke three thirty six is mentioned in the genealogy going down to Joseph, okay, Mary's husband. Japheth, what about Japheth? Well, it talks about that he was the ancestor basically of the European people, the German, the French, the British, Scottish, Irish, Spanish, the Caucasian races. Japheth is the father of those. Ham is the ancestor of the Africans and the Egyptians. All right, so Ham goes south, Japheth goes west, Shem goes east. That was the direction. That's where the races came from. Okay, let's look at the next uh, paragraph here under the Father Ham category on atla.org. It says here, Ham is the father of the dark-skinned, kinky-haired people. He is also the founder of the nation of Egypt. Well, he's right there. I can agree with him on that. And his knowledge has enabled his sons to become the builders of the great pyramids in Egypt. These are the inheritances of the sons of Father Ham, and they have been passed on to his descendants. Yet, when you see the dark-skinned, kinky-haired people today, they have fallen from their level of greatness. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying this stuff. Don't get mad at me. Don't call me a racist or something else. I am just reading what is on the guy's website. All right, now, let's talk about this thing of these, you know, uh, the descendants of Ham, you know, basically becoming the, the great people and inheriting things and everything. Let's look at what the Bible has to say about Egypt. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 5. We're going to read there a couple verses. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel, and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, now, if you study it out, Israel is a name that was that God gave to Jacob. Okay? And you trace it back. Again, look in Luke chapter 3. You have the genealogy listed there. Luke chapter 3, verse 34 mentions Jacob. Okay? Jacob is one of the descendants of Shem, not Ham. All right? So God's chosen people are the Jews from Shem. He did not choose Ham, and he did not choose Japheth either. But let's continue here. Ezekiel 20, verse 5. Uh, and I'll start over again here. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel, and lifted up mine hand unto the house of the, or unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them, to bring them forth, of the land of Egypt into a land that I had spied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Then said I unto them, Cast ye every man, away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known unto them in bringing them forth of the, out of the land of Egypt. Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. God never used Egypt. Egypt was always the enemy of his people, the Jews. All right, They were in bondage there. Joseph was taken down, sold as a slave. Okay, And God used Joseph in 
the situation there in Egypt, but he did not. He blessed Egypt through Joseph. He didn't bless it because of the people there. He called them heathens. All right, And God commanded his people when they finally got out. You read about that in the book of Exodus. They left Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. Egypt is a sinful, cursed place in all throughout the Bible. And so why would this Manning guy try to say that Egypt is somehow God's chosen nation? That's ridiculous. But now let me ask a question. Where will Jesus eventually establish his throne? Now during the Millennial Kingdom, Jesus Christ is going to come back and he's going to set up his throne, his kingdom, for 1,000 years on this planet. Where is he going to set up this kingdom? Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 says, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. All right, At the end of the tribulation, there's going to be the judgment of nations, and, you know, the Bible talks about the days having to be shortened in the tribulation, um, that, you know, basically that some flesh would be left alive, that, you know, the Lord's actually going to shorten the seven-year tribulation a little bit, I believe, supernaturally. And the nations that are left from that horrible time period, I mean, I, I think probably I've heard different statistics, maybe half the world's population or two-thirds of the world population is going to be killed, during the Great Tribulation, so those that are left are going to have to go up every year to worship the king. But now where are they going to go? You know, those nations which were, which came against Jerusalem are going to be the ones that are going to have to go worship Jesus Christ. But where do they go? Well, let's look at Zach, Zechariah 14, verse 17. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Now look at verse 18. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Why does God single out Egypt, because that is the center of wickedness. It's the most evil place on the planet. And if you study the Illuminati at all, it's a known fact that all members of the Illuminati, all families, at some time have to make a pro pilgrimage to Egypt. That's a well-established, well-documented fact. And you'll see all these rich, powerful leaders, and they all go and they visit Egypt. Why? Because it's the oldest occult center, essentially, in the world. Now let's look at Zechariah 14, verse 20. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and seethe therein. And in that day... Now look at this. There shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. What is a Canaanite? Remember? Canaan, the son of Ham. Canaanites are from Ham. All right, now let me read a little bit more from this guy's website, this Manning's website. Uh, back to the thing about Pastor James David Manning. It says here, the Atla World Missionary Church has become a landmark in Harlem, and the teaching of the church has attracted thousands to the light it brings to a once forsaken community. I thought that was kind of interesting. Brings thousands to the light. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of... Light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, back to the Father Ham thing here. He says here on his website, However, Almighty God has raised up the Honorable James David Manning as the priest for this generation. There's no pride there, is there? To speak a word of deliverance unto them. That word is called Atla. 
the land of the great light people. <laughs> Harlem, New York is the land of the great light people. I mean, it's crazy. God is returning world power to the dark-skinned, kinky-haired people, and when they rise, they shall institute a level of superiority that cannot be denied nor rivaled by the existing world. Wow. Now, why is it that this guy's allowed to get away with that? I mean, if you had a white man that came out and he said, you know, I'm going to bring in a level of superiority among the white races. If I said that, you wouldn't let me get away with it. You'd call me a, ra a racist, a racist, uh, racial supremacist. Sure, and I would be. I don't believe that way. Okay, I'm totally fine with, with uh, African American people, black people, whatever you want to call them. I think it's great to see them when they get saved. And I've heard some decent messages from them. I mean, I'm not against black people. I don't hate them. But this guy is saying that, he's, that his black people, the Hamites, are going to usher in a level of superiority. Even though the Bible says in Zechariah 14.21, there shall no more be the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts, when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. You say, well, that's racism. It's all, you know, Jewish supremacy or something. Well, okay, you're going to have to deal with that. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay, God is going to restore the nation of Israel, and he is going to be the ruler of it. He's going to be the king of Jerusalem. And all the nations, including Egypt, are going to have to come up and worship before the Lord. So, that's very important to understand. And this James Manning guy is lying to people and telling them something different. Now, let's look at another paragraph here in uh, the thing about Pastor James David Manning. It says here, as a younger man, let's see if I got this right. Yeah. It says here, as a younger man, Manning burglarized homes, mostly on Long Island. He spent about three and a half years in prison in New York and Florida for burglary, robber, robbery, larceny, criminal possession of a weapon, and other charges before his release in 1978. While in prison, he became a devout Christian. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Okay, this guy, I believe, is a, is a Catholic. Um, and we're going to look at that in just a little bit here, too. But, you see, I believe that uh, what really happened is that while he was in prison, he kind of figured out, you know, there's got to be an easier way to make money than going around burglarizing homes. Uh, I mean, that takes work. You have a lot of leg work. you got to run. you got you know, everything. You know, it's a lot easier to con people out of their money in a church building. And, of course, you read about that in the Bible. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. That's what I'm doing. Verse 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. All right? And there's a bunch of other verses, too, that talk about, you know, good words and fair speeches, and they make merchandise of you and everything. And that's all this guy is. But uh, you can find this on the website as well. He talks about his conversation with two angels. And right when he got out of prison, he was walking through a park somewhere in New York City, and there were two men sitting there, and he walked over, and it turned out that they were two angels, and they were sitting in a park in New York City playing chess. <laughs> uh-huh. Sure. Or checkers or something, I guess it must have been. Checkers or chess, whichever it was. Uh, but one of these angels' names, are you ready for this? He said his name was King Totally Good Joseph. <laughs> King Totally Good Joseph. That was this angel's name. And, of course, he went on to tell Pastor Manning that he was going to be a great man of God and all this other stuff. Yeah, uh-huh. And people fall for this. You know, but it's interesting. Colossians two verse eighteen says, "Let no man beguile you of your reward and a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind." No, he did not see angels in a park in New York playing checkers. Okay, he, he did not. That's a lie. Well, unless they were fallen angels, maybe he saw those. 
All right, now, let's look at another paragraph here on atla.org. It says here, His congregation, Atla Worldwide Missionary Church, is the former Bethelite Missionary Baptist Church. The church is also the site of Atla Theological Seminary. Now look at this. Where the renowned and educationally astute Honorable James David Manning, Ph.D., offers classes on preaching and prophecy. Well, there's no pride there, is there? You know, the renowned and educationally astute Honorable. <laughs> I mean, come on. How can people fall for this thing? And it's interesting because 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, not many... I'm sorry, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. One of the marks of a true minister of Jesus Christ, they will not glory in in themselves, they will glory in the Lord. And this false prophet, this Manning guy, glories in himself. I mean, this is from his website, the renowned and educationally astute, honorable. He wrote that. You know? It, guy's a false prophet. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Well, you better pay attention to that if you want to be educated as a preacher, you know, meaning college indoctrination. Uh, chapter 3, verse 20. And again, the Lord, know, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Look out for this education stuff. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. You know, I know of a couple... Uh, men out there, not, aren't very many of them, but they have a PhD, and uh, most of the time they'll brag about that, but I do know of a few that you'll never even know that they had a PhD. They don't call themselves doctor, they're just pastor so-and-so. That's the way it should be. All right, Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Okay? And that's a perfect description of this man, this Manning guy. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 7 even speaks about ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can go to Union Theological Seminary and get every degree that they have and still go to hell and do nothing for the Lord your whole life. And most of them do. Okay? Now, let's look at... Uh, Another thing here that Manning teaches, it says um, on his website, again I'm reading directly from his website, he says, Focus on purgatory. The Protestant church founded by Martin Luther, the reformer, is ignorant of the place commonly referred to as purgatory. The Catholic church, on the other hand, has known about purgatory and the power given to the priest to intercede on behalf of its inhabitants. Almighty God would not have you ignorant of the place and purpose of purgatory. Yeah, right. As the priest for this generation, the Honorable James David Manning put forth a teaching on the misconception and misgivings many people have regarding purgatory. However, he doesn't stop there, but offers concrete proof to the validity and purpose of purgatory. And it says, click here to order the pamphlet, Focus on Purgatory. Okay, this is a big subject. I'm going to give you a couple verses here just to show you that purgatory is ridiculous. It's anti-scriptural. It's blasphemy, as a matter of fact. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Did you get that? All sin. Not some sins that are going to have to be purged later in purgatory. See, that's the purpose of purgatory is, you know, you worked hard to get to heaven, but, you you know, you have some sins and they have to kind of be burned and stuff and tried a little bit in the fires of purgatory so that eventually you can get in. No, 
If you are saved, if you're born again, if you have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins are paid for. They're taken away. They're gone. And to teach otherwise is blasphemy. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, they'll try to use this a little once in a while. Speaking of the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. He is the rock of our salvation, not Peter and the Catholic Church. Okay, Jesus Christ is the rock. You get saved, and now what do you build on Jesus Christ? That's where your good works come in. 1 Corinthians 3.12 Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Oh, oh, then that's purgatory. No, keep reading. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay? You are saved. The only thing that you're going to get to see burn up at the judgment seat of Christ are your works. Okay, the wood, hay, stubble are things that you've done for yourself, for your own glory. The gold, silver, precious stones are things that you've done for the Lord. Okay, now that's another study in and of itself, and it's something that you should study. Another thing, too, is Romans chapter 4. You can read that whole chapter. It talks about righteousness and imputed righteousness. And there again, the Catholics do not understand this thing of imputation. And there's a good verse in Philemon that talks about, if he is wrong thee or oweth thee ought, put that on mine account. Okay, now that's a good definition of imputation. You see, because you've wronged God, you've sinned before God. And Jesus Christ took your sins and put them on himself at the cross. And he took his righteousness, and when you're washed in the blood... Jesus Christ's righteousness becomes your righteousness. And that's how God sees you when it comes time for judgment. All right, That's called imputation. Now, if Jesus Christ imputed righteousness onto you, then why on earth would you have to burn in purgatory to be purified? It's ridiculous. Okay, now there's a whole lot more on purgatory to show that it's ridiculous. Another study. Now let's go on to... Uh, let's see, where am I at here? Paragraph here on the, about this James Manning guy. It says here about the 2008 election. Manning achieved some controversy in the 2008 presidential election after Atla posted several sermons of his that were harshly critical of Democratic candidate Barack Obama on the website YouTube. Among other accusations, he called Obama a good house negro. Now that's his quote. I'm reading from his website. Don't get mad. In one sermon while in another, he referred to Obama as trash, quote-unquote trash, that's what he called him, due to his mixed-race heritage and accused him of being a pimp and long-legged Mac Daddy, citing the viral video, I got, I got a crush on Obama. He stated that Obama had has the cadence of an Islamic person, and he called Obama's mother trash. Manning defended his sermons in an interview on Fox News, saying that we also have to talk about his character. He further stated that God told him that Hillary Clinton would win the Democratic primary and that Obama would not become the president. Now, did that happen? No. Manning illustrated how God showed him Hillary would win by revealing her card in the light. Okay, let me read a verse to you from the Bible. Deuteronomy 18, verse 22 says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, this is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Okay, the test for a false prophet is, if they say, God told me such and such, a prophecy, and it doesn't come to pass, then you instantly say, there can be no failure. God cannot lie. So, it didn't come to pass, what's that mean? That means that James Manning is a false prophet. Okay? 
He's a false prophet. By the Bible's own test. But look at what he says here. And this is, again, his website. After his prophecies didn't come true, he defended them by saying, that is what God said to him, and he will continue to follow in his faith. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? He blames God for a false prophecy. He said, oh, it's not me. I'm not a false prophet. It's God's fault. God told it to me. That's wickedness. That is an evil man. Okay, this is not a this man is not a Christian. Okay? He is a wicked devil. And you would do well not to listen to him. If you want to research him, check him out, make sure I'm not lying, go for it. But if you're stupid enough, if you're a Christian and you're dumb enough to go and think that this guy's saved and start following him, giving him money and things like that, well, there's not much hope for you. Okay? Now let's look at Another passage here. <laughs> this one's a real good one. I think you're going to enjoy this if you're a, if you have any sense at all. If you're a Bible believer, oh, you're, you're going to love this. It says here again, reading from his website, atla.org. He says he proclaimed Obama supporter Oprah Winfrey a Babylonian whore, the queen of the universe, and here he's going, and the Antichrist. <laughs> Run, children, run. Uh, Run, children, run, children. And tell everybody that you know, Oprah Winfrey is the Antichrist. Oh, brother. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means. Got to look out for deceivers. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There is not one verse in the entire Bible that says that the Antichrist is a woman. Not one. Oprah Winfrey is a woman. All right? It's ridiculous. Okay, the guy is just... He's kooky. All right, finally, it says here, The sermons drew the attention of the Americans United for Separation of Church and State, who filed a complaint with the Internal Revenue Service objecting to alleged violations of laws granting tax-free status to churches on condition that they refrain from certain forms of political activity. In other words, if you don't know what that means, when you are a 501c3 church, you are not permitted to say anything against the government. You cannot speak negatively about the president. You can't speak negatively about the IRS. You are under government control. You give up your First Amendment right when you sign up for a 501c3 tax-exempt status. And just to clarify it, I sent an email asking them if they were 501c3 tax-exempt, and they wrote back, yes, that they are. I have the email right here. Write to them if you don't believe me. Don't take my word for it. So they are a 501c3 incorporated church. It's a false church. Manning has no right. He's complaining and crying because they're going to arrest me and everything. Well, they should arrest him. because not, not because of his kooky beliefs, you know, whatever. But they should arrest him because he signed up for 501c3 status. He does not have permission to speak against politicians. He has no right to speak against President Obama. I'm not a friend. I'm not a a defender of Obama by any means. But the fact is, he's the president of this country. Manning signed up as a 501c3 incorporated church. He is not permitted to speak against Obama. Period. They should throw the books at him. Okay, he's a false prophet. Now just let me give you a couple, and don't listen to the guy. Okay, you want to search it out? Go for it. But uh, you've got to watch out for this kind of thing. And uh, I just want to give a couple verses here in closing uh, as instruction in righteousness to you if you're saved. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, 
James David Manning, I think fits right into that. Doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, and I think his conscience is seared with a hot iron. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. They'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, here's your advice as a Christian, if you're listening to this thing. Okay? 2 Timothy 4, 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, Please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.